Hey everyone, in this video I'll be surviving a full year in Don't Starve's Lights Out mode, where it's always nighttime and it's never daytime. I'll be picking Wendy, because she's awesome, but more importantly, Abigail gets a permanent night attack buff. My goal for this challenge is to survive and kill Ancient Fuel Weaver before the end of the first year. Spoilers ahead, I do try to beat as many raid bosses as I can, but I didn't get around to Klaus, Toastal, the Twins, or the Eye of Terror. But I did get around to every other common rush boss, so no worries. I'd also like to thank Lardy for his tips and tricks and his extensive and incredible guides, as without them I wouldn't have been able to complete this challenge, especially the boss fights. Without anything else, let's get right into it. When I spawned in, I checked the starting chest next to the portal and collected the provided tools and materials. With these I was able to craft a torch which I equipped and unequipped in the dark to get as much light out of it as I could as I set out into the darkness. My first priority was to find some gold rocks to get the gold I needed for the science machine and alchemy engine. I found some gold rocks in a mosaic biome not too far from spawn, so I took some time to mine them by lighting the nearby trees for light. My plan at this point was to save the materials for the crafting stations once I found a pack of beef loaf. After gathering rocks and gold, I jumped through a wormhole which took me to the Pig King deciduous biome. Here I hammered some pig houses for easy materials. I won't be worrying about pigs this run as I can't farm them because they never come out of their houses at night, and I find another way to efficiently farm meat. I make my way down a sinkhole into the caves to quickly gather some light bulbs for a lantern and some extra fuel. Resource gathering is uniquely tedious in lights out mode, so I made sure to hammer every pig house I saw for the free resources. I come across a spider quarry, which is extremely lucky for me, as with Abigail I'll be able to farm basically infinite stacks of monster meat. As I keep exploring the world I stumble across some beefalo in the savannah biome. These will be especially useful, as I'll be relying heavily on beefalo taming to give me additional movement speed, defense, and attack to counteract Wendy's innate attack debuff. The main problem I face however is that they're always asleep when not interacted with, so it's a hassle to feed them. I place my science machine, and then prototype an alchemy engine. I construct and equip my lantern, and I also craft a saddle. I bound my beefalo and called him Jam Jam, but I didn't know that beef attack you when you try to sell them with zero obedience. So because I didn't feed him, he turned aggressive and I had to run away to find another beefalo. After finding and binding another beefalo, I feed it some toys to raise its obedience and saddle it. I travel into the caves to search for a bunny village, which luckily was right next to the cave entrance I used. Farming bunny men in a pen allows me to collect one bunny puff, one carrot, a one meat daily per bunny with Abigail. Luckily for me, the bunny men run away and don't attack when they're low HP, which allows Abigail to survive and pick them off as they run away for free extra loot. I begin to hammer down the bunny hudges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. I'm able to make four hutches at my base. After that, I leave the caves through the sinkhole I came into and run into a central location of the map. I grab my pitchfork and roughly dig up tiles to plan out my base. I wanted it to be 5x5 tiles overall. I left enough space for an ice flingomatic in the center to cover the whole base, however that's pointless because wildfires only happen during the day in summer. I placed my fire pit which I will later replace with more permanent solutions. Next I dug out a 2x2 square into the base design and began construction on my bunny hutch farm. I placed 4 walls on the borders and placed the hutches before placing the fences down in order to account for clipping and space of the larger structures. After that, I began on the fencing surrounding the hutches and keeping the bunnies in, and I left the space for a gate. I ran up to the spider party. Abigail made short work of the spiders, and I ended up collecting two stacks of monster meat. I was also able to get more silk than I have needed for various things and some healing salves. Next I went up a little further and burned down a small section of a lumpy forest to get some charcoal for the crock pots and drying racks. I noticed that a couple of the spider dens had already become level 3, so I decided to destroy them and replant the spider eggs somewhere closer. I also go to the desert to pick some cacti, and I luckily find a clockwork rook who gives me the gears needed for an icebox. I place down my icebox, and my two crop pots. During that trip I also dug up a large amount of twigs and grass, which I now replant in a nice little garden. During the full moon, I decided it was a good time to attend my ruins wash to get some full sight armor. But more importantly, I wanted a few star cooler stars for infinite light at my best, and when I do boss fights. With Abigail's help, I kill a giant tentacle that brings me to the wild biome, and from here I can find my way to the ruins proper. However, before I did that, I needed some living logs for the staffs, so I found a lunar mush tree biome and tried to find some mush gnomes that I convert into logs. <coughs> I killed a few mushrooms which netted me exactly 7 living logs, which, with a deconstruction animal, should be more than enough for what I need. The gnomes themselves were not too hard to kill, but their spore AoE attack was a little annoying and hurt my beef a little. 
I end up feeding my beefler many light bulbs to keep its obedience up, but this doesn't raise their hunger, so I had to be careful about being bucked and not being able to get back on. Once I see the pillars and the fields of Aoki, I know I'm near the ruins. Once I'm in the ruins, I begin mining the statues for gems in full sight. Although I'm completely invulnerable from almost every attack in the game on my beefler, the Clockwork Bishop is one of those exceptions. Their projectile attack will always hit me if I'm the last one drawing their aggro, so when I fight them, I try to let Abigail take the final hit. But with those two bishops down, I gain access to the complete ancient pseudoscience station for crafting. I keep exploring the ruins, and I collect more full sight and gems. I look at the maze, but I decide I will not be killing Ancient Guardian right now. I'll kill him in the summer when I come back down and I'm more prepared because I started running relatively low on food and healing, as you'll see in a little bit. With the materials I need, I start crafting, but I get interrupted by the nightmare phase, spawning a lot of nightmare creatures, so I have to run away. I have zero sanity, less than half hunger, and not a lot of health, and I'm running out of light bulbs. I jump off my beefler and try to feed it, but I misclick and make it rear, indicating that I don't have obedience to ride it. Because of this, I have to run away from the shadow creatures, and because of their speed, I have to run far enough away, so my beefalo runs to me, as I don't have enough time to manually wake and feed it. I am finally able to ride my beef again, and I aggro Abigail to kill some shadow splum monkeys for the nightmare fuel, and importantly, the bananas and morsels. During this, however, I get hit with a depth form wave. At the ancient pseudoscience station, I craft two star core stuffs and one deconstruction stuff. Then I craft a few full aside crowns. I forget to craft a magaluminescence in the moment, which I'll have to come back later to get. After everything I need is crafted, I head back for the tentacle holes and ride back to the cave entrance. I head back to my base and unload my messy and overloaded inventory on the ground, relatively organized. I also make some banana shakes to raise my sanity at the crock pot and call upon a star to line my base for the next couple of days. I also farm the four bunnies that are trapped in my pen for the resources of Abigail. And once I finish that, it's just about time for winter to take over. I decided that during the winter I won't do much fighting, and instead focus on building, expanding the base and resource collection, so I could safely say that I would be able to survive indefinitely, even after the challenge ends. I constructed some drying racks and I dig up some more resources and juicy berry bushes. I head back to base and the first normal winter has started to fall. I craft a winter hat for some insulation for the stacks of silk that I have. After planting some more grass and twigs in my small farm, I decide to use my remaining boards to craft some chests for a more prettier storage solution. Then I ride up to gather some more monster meat and destroy some spider nests with the help of Abigail and my beefalo. I end up planting some juicy berry bushes in a small patch at my base. I head back out to do some more resource collecting to fully fill my grass and twig farm. And while I'm out, I also decide to go to the McTusk camp as I need the walrus tusk for the walking cane in order to make the lazy explorer for the ancient field wheel fight. I end up being extra lucky and McTusk drops a walrus tusk but also a tam shanta which is a nice commodity to have. I'm back to planting more juicy berries at base for when spring comes around, as well as the twigs and grass I collected earlier. Finally, my farm is almost completed. I also finish building my drying racks to have a small reserve of jerky whenever I have meat to spare for the long spoilage time and the sanity game. I learned a trick for getting a lot of steel wool without hunting a Yukas. I placed a bunny shrine from the year of the Bunnymen event and offered it a carrot to spawn in a bunch of pillow fighting bunnymen. These bunnymen each spawn with a different pillow beneath them, and one of these is a steel wool pillow. With the deconstruction staff, I'm able to return the components of the pillow, which include two pieces of steel wool. With these, I'll be quickly and efficiently able to craft a war saddle later once my beef flow tames into an ornery tendency to greatly increase my attack potential. Next, before even thinking, I use the walrus tusk and some steel wool to craft a beef flow brush. This complicates everything later as I forget about this after winter has passed and I can't get another tusk, so I have to plan around bringing the materials for a deconstruction staff and a walking cane down to the caves later in summer to recollect and repurpose the tusk. I ride off and decide that this is a good time to head to a graveyard to help a couple of pip spooks to collect some morning glory for Abigail's potions, which I'll need later in the run for the harder bosses. I don't particularly like doing the quest for the pip spooks, as I always feel they lead me in random directions, and the area in which they indicate that we're right next to the lost trinket is hard to notice because of their strange halo. The first pip spook named me seven morning glory, and as I was helping another pip spook, I heard the familiar growls of deer clops spawning in on day 30.
With the first boss of the year defeated, I collected the Diclops Eye and headed back to my base. I pre-crafted a couple of beekeeper hats and a few marble suits to prepare for the Queen Bee fight. After that, I needed to make a few healing potions for Abigail, which I'll need for the Queen Bee, but I also need to stock up a few for the Ancient Fuel Weaver fight in advance. Spectral Cure Rolls required Telltale Hearts in their crafting recipe, so I had to sacrifice a little bit of HP for two potions. I also decided to craft an unyielding draught just because I had some morning glory left over, and the rest I put aside for later. The next day I went to collect some replacement light bulbs from my lantern, and as I entered the caves my beeflo finally turned into an ornery beeflo. The ornery temperament increases my beeflo damage to 50 per hit. With Abigail's 1.15x pedal boost, this is incredible, and it will only get better with the war saddle which will let me do as much damage as Mighty Wolfgang with a fresh handbat in addition to Abigail's DPS. I wanted to try to get a bird so I could convert my monster meat into eggs for pierogi, as I don't have a good solution for healing during fights. I heard that by baiting a bird trap and reloading the area by leaving the screen, there is a chance for a bird to appear in the trap automatically. I also heard that cacoons have a chance of vomiting a bird as a gift, but I later saw this chance is incredibly low, so unfortunately for me, I wasted the next day just feeding cacoons with twigs and hoping they'd give me a bird. A very long amount of time. They gave me some wool an electrical doodad, some other random stuff, and a lot of seeds. I went back home and baited a trap. I also made a bug net and caught some fireflies to make a minus hat. Great surprise, my trap had a bird inside by leaving the screen just once, but I didn't want to let it go to waste, as I still didn't have enough materials for a bird cage. and before I knew it, it was time for spring. To start off the new season, I began collecting rabbits for a war saddle. Since they don't come out, I needed to dig their burrows and run them into my traps. Abigail ended up just killing any rabbit I caught, so I had to call her back into her flower. Sometimes the rabbits would also just straight up run through the trap, but then I realized all I had to do was wait for them to fall asleep and then I could drop the trap on top of them to catch them. I had to chop some trees to get logs for the war saddle, which of course summoned a tree guard which I had to handle as I was trying to equip the new saddle. I ended up tanking the tree guard and taking him out pretty fast with my crazy DPS. After the tree guard was dead, I also made an eyebrella to handle the constant rain of spring. With the saddle acquired, it was time to prepare for dragonfly. First, I needed to pick some blue mushrooms to heal my beeflo during the fight, so I traveled to the blue mushroom forest in the caves and picked an abundance of them. As I was looking for the dragonfly desert, I went in the direction of the map that I still hadn't explored. On the way, I passed through a swamp, which now meant I had access to the reeds to refine the papyrus needed to make a bird cage. I picked eight and continued on. Killing dragonfly was my main priority in this desert, but I also needed to pick some tumbleweeds, as they have a small chance to drop regular seeds. I was sad to learn that the vegetable seeds that cacoons dropped could not be used to make a bird cage, so I began picking as many of them as I could in order to get two seeds. This also gave me the time to stock up on cacti. Once I found Dragonfly and her mangrove balls, I identified the farthest and most isolated one and built a series of long walls to either side in order to confuse the pathing of the larvae that she spawns, as I don't want to deal with them and their fire damage when I'm fighting her. The Dragonfly fight went more smooth than I expected and I had no trouble whatsoever.
Dragonfly down, I mainly looted the gems that I could use later when I go back down into the ruins for the final fight. When I was setting up the arena, I did notice that there was a shadow chest piece very nearby, so I used my beef loader to drop it off at the shadow chest set piece in the oasis desert. Then I had to go back and pick up my piggyback. My next plan was to immediately attempt Queen B, and for this reason, I collected my bird, refined the papyrus, and placed my bird because I'll need healing, as this is one of the two fights that I'll have to fight without the help of my beef load, due to the high damage being burnt. My icebox is completely full of rock, and a whole stack of monster meat is about to spoil, so I decided to gather some more up at the spider quarry. As I'm finding the spiders though, I end up spawning a spider queen, which I kill, even though I don't really need to as she doesn't technically count as a main boss, in the same vein as a tree guy. This spider queen however spawns another queen and then another comes after that, I end up fighting three of them in total. When I get back, a frog rain occurs and I get a ridiculous amount of frog legs, so now my icebox is completely full of meat. With the eggs I gathered from my bird, I begin cooking up some pierogi for the upcoming fight. However, on the way to the queen bee hive, I notice that a moose goose nest has spawned, so I make the most of the opportunity to take out another boss. The fight with Moose Goose went smoothly, but I make a stupid mistake and resummon Abigail to help me kill the angry Mosslings. The combined whirlwind attack of multiple Mosslings completely depletes Abigail's health, and she ends up dying for me. So now I have to delay the Queen Bee fight by an additional 3 days as I wait for her to upgrade back up to level 3. I make the most of this additional time by planning and preparing ahead by catching more rabbits during another frog rain. I'll use these rabbits to craft a Prestahatitator, which will allow me to make a Shadow Manipulator, so that I can craft a Nightmare Amulet that I need for the Fuel Weaver fight. Once I craft it, I drop it in my pile of stuff. I then also go and collect another suspicious marble to complete the chest pieces. This one ended up being the Rook. After that, I made a routine visit to the Blue Mushroom Forest and was finally able to attempt Bee Queen. Many people consider Bee Queen to be one of the hardest bosses in the game, but with Abigail, the main problem being the Grumble Bees, I dealt with relatively easily.
Bee Queen has some of the most important and valuable drops in the game. She drops her crown, which converts negative sanity auras to positive ones, and more importantly gives me access to jelly beans for overtime healing using her royal jelly, and also lets me store a lot more and at no cost of spoilage with the bundling wrap recipe. I take the time to help another pip spook to collect some more morning glory for more spectral cure-alls. After that, I head to the desert to pick cactus. My plan here now is to begin prepping all my supplies for the fuel weaver fight, and I need the cooked cactus to give me sanity, so I pick as much as I can, and because I now have access to the bundling wrap, I'm able to store as much as I like without the risk of spoilage, so I can put it aside for now and take the bundle when I'm ready. At this point, I've already had a minor panic over how I'm going to craft the Lazy Explorer, since I used the walrus tusk for a brush I only used like two times. To deconstruct and recraft the brush into a walking cane, I need to bring an alchemy engine down with me, so I collect enough to pre-craft it. Next I come back to my cooking station and start prepping some pierogi. For this I need eggs, meat, and vegetables. Although the bird is incredible to have in this run, whenever I want to use it, I need to wake it up by taking it out of the cage and placing it back in and this only lets me feed it about 6 times before it falls asleep again. I bundled the pierogi that I made, together with a fresh handbat and the cactus. I also bundled the full side crowns to conserve space in my inventory, as well as the crafting materials I need for a deconstruction staff in another bundle. With summer nearing very close, I need to prepare the final chess piece for the shadow chess pieces during the next new move. I find and carry the bishop piece on my beeflo back to the set piece with all the others that I had collected. Without a beeflo, this process would take an incredibly long amount of time. Here you can see what I mean about converting meat into eggs as I constantly have to wake up my bird between feedings. I collect the reeds needed for a luxury fan which will be all that I need for the summer heat. Since it's always night, I'll overheat much slower, especially when I'm on the surface. With nothing else to do right now, I head down into the cave to the rocky biome in order to gather the fossil fragments for the ancient skeleton. I'm able to gather one from a random salamite and without me noticing, it's time for summer. I continue into the first day of summer on my quest for fossil fragments. It's much more efficient to mine the case spider dens, as although they get permanently removed, they do have a 100% drop rate for one or more fossil fragments, which will make the whole process much quicker. After a while of mining the dens, I have more than enough fragments for the skeleton, so I headed back up to the surface. Summer is usually the most annoying season to deal with, but in Lights Out it's actually quite comfortable and comparable to Autumn with the lack of environmental effects. I decided it would be wise to defeat Antlion in the first couple of days to avoid the disturbances that it causes. I took a thermal stone which I froze in the icebox and headed into the oasis desert to find it. I had a lot of trouble locating Antlion. I wasn't sure if it maybe takes a few days for it to spawn in because the sandstorms hadn't started until I had already ran around for a bit. During all this running around, I failed to notice my thermal stone had heated up, so once I found an line and gave it the thermal stone to start the fight by freezing it, it just ended up eating it right in front of me. Mm, Reluctantly, I rode back to my base, crafted another thermal stone and placed it inside my icebox. As it cooled, I began cooking some jelly beans with the royal jelly, as it had already started to spoil a little. I rode back with the completely frozen thermal stone offered it as a tribute, and I was ready to start the fight properly. Antlion was an incredibly easy fight. The small health pool coupled with the limited attack pattern meant I was able to defeat it in little over a minute. Antlion doesn't really drop anything that I need so I learned the blueprints and took whatever I could before leaving. From my calculations the next from my calculations, the next full moon was going to be on day 61, which would allow me to summon the shadow chest pieces. I'll be doing this fight on my beeflo, so I collected some blue mushrooms for healing. Since I couldn't progress any further without defeating the chess pieces, and I had already prepared everything I needed for later, I spent the entirety of day 60 doing absolutely nothing. 
All this waiting had me ready to move when it became day 61, so I rode off into the desert and came across the chess pieces which had started to rumble. I got off my beefalo to break one to start the fight. I have to admit that this was one of the harder boss fights I had encountered so far in my run. I don't have much experience fighting these guys, and on top of that I had to fight them in a very difficult setting, as it was right in the middle of a sandstorm which limited my visibility, so I had to fight them next to the oasis. In the end, I decided to leave the Shadow Bishop for last, as with the B floor I only ended up taking a few hits every time it teleported, and I could use Abigail during the downtime for extra damage. With the Shadow Atrium in our possession, we were now in the final section of the challenge. With all of my supplies, I headed down into the caves one last time. I made my way into the ruins and collected some extra foresight I had missed previously. Now at the studio science station, I was able to craft the deconstruction staff and get the walrus tusk back from the beefler brush. At the alchemy engine, I crafted the walking cane and converted it into the laser explorer. With almost everything I needed, there was one last thing to collect. The atrium key from the ancient guardian. So I ran into the maze to defeat him.
Ancient Guardian down, I collected some goodies from his chest, along with the Atrium Key. The Yellow Gems will let me craft the Magaluminescence for the Fuel Weaver fight. I headed back, ready to fight the next boss, Nightmare Werepick, to get the Dread Stone for the Shadow Event. For this, I would need a Pick Slash Axe to free him by breaking his chains. The Nightmare Wear Pig fight was definitely not my cleanest. It was actually my first time fighting him since he was added, and I got caught off guard by his pounces, which knocked me off my beefalo a couple times. He has a really nasty cycle, which punishes beefalo riders by not allowing you to get back on unless you time your saddling correctly, and if he attacks your beefalo, it'll ignore you and aggro onto him, which could kill it. With the Dreadstone in hand, I went back to the Ancient Guardian Arena to get the yellow gems and crafted a mag at the pseudoscience station. I used a wall and gate exploit to clip myself into the void so I could walk over to the shadow atrium without going through the hassle of traversing there normally. I found the atrium fairly nearby while riding my beefalo and I used the rescue command to teleport myself into the arena. It was finally time for one of the most tough and finicky boss fights in the game, so I dropped all of my bundles and prepared all of my equipment and food after inserting the key into the atrium and building the skeleton. Enjoy my full, unedited, and unsped up fight of Ancient Fuel Weaver. I'd like to thank you for watching if you're still here, and if you like these sort of challenge runs for DST or any other game, please let me know your suggestion down below and subscribe.